Fear throttles everything we do in life. When it goes unmanaged, it can inhibit us from reaching our potential. But when used to our advantage, it will allow us to push past self-limiting beliefs. As this week's guest, self-defense expert, Coach Tony Blauer teaches us, we can't be brave if we aren't afraid. Tony teaches us there's more to self-defense than learning a martial art, practicing our draw, or putting rounds down range. As he says, we will practice all areas of self-defense, but oftentimes neglect practicing actual self-defense. This is the No Excuse to Miss podcast. Welcome to the No Excuse to Miss podcast. I am your host, Scott Volkwartzen, and this week I'm honored to be joined by Coach Tony Blauer. Tony has been in the martial art, self-defense, defensive tactics, and combative industry for over four decades. He's founded Blauer Tactical Systems back in 1985 and is responsible for developing the Spear System in addition to the No Fear concept. Welcome to the show, Tony. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, man. And, and guess who I had dinner with yesterday? I think you had dinner with Jay Frugia yesterday. I did. I did. <laughs> Let's just talk about Jay on the whole show. <laughs> it would take a couple shows, probably. Right. He's such a he's such a neat guy. Well, if it weren't for him, I wouldn't have. I probably would have never done a podcast or a lot of things I do. Yeah, he's. Uh, we were talking about that last night. It was. Uh, it was just how infectious his personality, his enthusiasm. And how he's just, he just makes connections. It's, I mean, it's how we met. Yes. And that's what, like, there's a, he's connected me to like the, well, we, we met at Sorenex, but he connect, connected me to that whole Sorenex group. Right. By sending Brandon Lilly over at Chat Show. And, you know, through there, I met Bert and the whole team. And then. It's crazy. It, it's crazy how, when I look back, how many times he's introduced me to people and connected. So I'm very grateful for that. Yeah, he's a good dude. Yes, he is. So I want to, there's a lot of different topics I could go to here, but I kind of want to focus on both the spear system and then like the no fear concept. Sure. But prior to getting into that, how did you get into this space? Because I know in doing some research, you were a skier and you said if it was almost by hack, by circumstance that you ended up not going on further in the skiing space that you ended up in the self-defense. So how did that happen? Um, well, I grew up, I grew up in Canada. I live in California now. I uh, don't hold that against me. And, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, but I, my family were skiers. I always make this joke, you know, that you, if you're from Canada, you're a skier or a skater. And I just happened to grow up on skis and I got really, really good competitive level. And, uh, you know, one of the classic stories that I share at the, the no fear seminar. And, and because this is only audio, I want your listeners to know that no fear is spelled K N O W fear, not no fear, like no fear, like the battle cry. Um, but, uh, I always, uh, was afflicted by suffered from wrestled with fear, the psychology of fear at, at, at the youngest age. It didn't matter if I was, uh, I, I wrestled at a young age, competitively gymnastics, t tennis played all, I was a good all around athlete, but I would always, everything I did, I was worried about the outcome. I was worried about winning or losing. I was worried about letting down the coach or the team or do what, you know, what my dad would think. Uh, but not just like the normal, like, Oh, I, I just want to be liked. I was like, I felt like I was really afflicted by fear. And of course, you know, when you're seven, eight, nine, 10, 12, 15 years old, you're not articulating it. I'm not going to, geez, I'm not, you know, I'm 12 years old going, ah, will I ever self-actualize? You know, I'm not, you're not thinking, <laughs> you're not thinking like that, right? You're, yeah. you're like, what the, and then even to today, if you ask somebody who, who you can sense is clearly afraid of something, uh, or apprehensive or resisting something, most especially men, but most people will not say, well, you know, I've been thinking about a lot and I've introspected a lot. And what I realize is I'm just afraid of, they don't say that. They, they rationalize, and you've seen the play on words, rational hyphen lies. Uh, you know, they rationalize why they aren't asking somebody for a date or starting their new podcast or quitting the job they hate, and starting the one that they love. And, and fear is around us in every way and it actually affects everything we do in our lives at a noxious level we don't realize 
you know, how, how it affects how, you know, who you talk to, who therefore who your friends and who, who you get married to, where you live and so on and so forth. And now circle back to me as a young kid, as a skier, I was one of the best skiers on my team. And, and, uh, but I never won a race. I was always like the guy who, you know, in, in practice killed it and then always caught a tip skiing too hard. But it wasn't like some people would say, oh, so self-sabotage. Well, depending on, on your, you know, definition of it, but I was fit and I showed up at the races. So it wasn't like I, I was just trying too hard because I couldn't focus on what I needed to, to hit proverbial flow state, just be, you know, one with whatever was happening. And, uh, nobody, nobody noticed because it always looked like an accident. Oh man, you were going so hard. You caught that tip too bad. You hit that piece of ice there, but that was like the story. And, and so the joke I make, you know, as, as far as your reference is, had I been a better skier, I'd have never gotten into self-defense because <laughs> now I'd be, you know, selling skis and ski wax as a retired Olympian or something. Right. So, uh, so I always make that joke, but a significant part of the story is this, and it might, we might segue into the no fear before the spear as a result of this, because I, I, uh, a couple of years ago, I was really thinking about this when I was putting together our, our, our workshop and I was trying to think of a story that people could relate to. And, and I remember one day at a race, my ski coach, uh, asking me about 15 minutes before the race, how I felt. And I'd already, like I wanted to projectile vomit. I was so nervous. I'd already pissed like five times, right? You know, in the, in the trees, you're up there. And we're at Mont Tremblant up in the Laurentians. And we're, the, the starting gate is like above the tree line. So there's like, there's like the wind is howling. There are no trees. That's how, how cold it is. And uh, um, I was like going through the middle of the pack. The, uh, the uh, you know, the, the, the best time in any type of race is to, is to go near the beginning when the course is fresh. Once it starts getting ruts and, and icy. So if you're not that good, you get you get seated last. And I was like in the middle to last. The course was a mess. So my coach says, how do you feel, kid? And I'm like, good, coach. I feel great. Like I just I lied to him like we do. If something's wrong with you, Scott, and I come in and I see you there like, like in a funk, I go, hey, dude, what's up? 99% of people go, nothing. Why? What's up? What do you mean? Because we don't we don't have the self awareness or the confidence to be vulnerable without milking it, just to go look, man. I, like I really need to talk to somebody right now. Okay. And um, so I lied to my coach, like most of us do, if this makes sense. I said I feel great, I feel good. And he says, okay, just watch out. Like in the middle of the course, the, the gate fifty, there's a lot of ice. Take that high and outside, blah blah. So I take off like a batter to hell, and I sure enough, I wipe out three gates from the bottom. I I fall so hard that I actually slide through the finish line. It's a giant slalom race. And uh, and what's significant, because I want people to understand uh, that I was really good at this. What I wasn't good at, you know, we talk about physical fitness, but a lot of people don't talk about mental fitness. I was a really good skier. And when I didn't have the pressure of winning or losing and that performance, I was one of the best in, in, you know, my age group in that area. Uh, at, at the end of the, um, at the end of the uh, event, they got timers, right? This is like a big zone race. They have timers going, you know, and one of the guys comes up to me and says, Hey kid, too bad you wiped out. Cause you were almost a second ahead of the guy that ultimately won a race when you passed my marker. Now for people who have no clue, like, like a second in a giant slalom race is, I don't know, like a mile and like you lap somebody in, in, uh, you know, a Le Mans race or something like it's a big, wow. it's a big significant. <laughs> so that's, that's how fast I was going, but I just couldn't keep it together. Now, the whole point of the story is this. I realized it was a couple of years later, or sorry, a couple of years ago that I was writing an article and I was really thinking about this. And I realized that my ski coach wasn't really a coach. He was a ski trainer. He was teaching me how to turn. He was teaching me how to plant my pole. He was teaching me how to strategize the movement. But to me, a coach is about inspiring performance. And it's a distinction I've made as I grow my company and my team is I go, I don't need trainers. I need coaches. I need people that inspire performance. And the difference is this. And I should, let me, let me requalify that. Everyone who works for me 
has a skill as a technician, trainer, coach. Technician meaning this is your grip. Like, so if I was going to learn shooting, how to shoot better from you, you know, and this is an interesting thing. Uh, uh, if I'm afraid of firearms, but I decide I'm going to get you to make me a custom gun and I want you to teach me a little bit. If I'm afraid of firearms and you don't know I'm afraid of firearms, I will never shoot well. Even though I got my hands and you go, this is your grip and this is the stance that I like. And, and, and here's a rep scheme. This is a course of fire. And if you do this a lot, you're going to get really good. I can do all of that, but I will never do well if I'm afraid of the firearm. And, and so the coach is about demystifying the neurobiology, the neuroscience, and most coaches don't know that. So most, I, 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 I said this uh, years ago, talking to one of the world's most famous uh, uh, coaches in his industry, I said, most coaches are just cheerleaders. And he goes, what? I said, they're there screaming, come on, you got this, come on, let's go, let's do it, come on, go. You're like, like, if the reason this person isn't uh, expressing their full potential and they're a lifelong athlete, it's not the skill set. It's something else in their head. On game day, it's it's all mental. You can't be a different athlete on game day. And so I go back to full circle. Here I am, this 15-year-old kid, lies to my coach. I'm a good coach. And I go out and I wipe out again. And, and you know, this is the downward spiral of my skiing career. But I had this epiphany. What if my ski coach, who was really a ski trainer, was a coach? What would he have done differently? And I tell this story at seminars, and I've had grown adults start to cry at this, where I, I, I share this idea, if you can visualize this on audio, where imagine him 15 minutes before when I said, when he said, hey, how you feeling, kid? And I turned to him and I went, great, coach. If he had said, hey, come over here. And he looked at me, he said, I've been coaching you for five years. You're an amazing skier. You've got really uh, like tons of talent and potential. Have you noticed that you never finish a race? I might have looked at him and went, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, yeah. and, and you put his arm around me and he goes, hey, come on, what's going on? I don't, I don't know what to talk about. Like if he had drawn out of me that I'm afraid to let him down or let my parents down, or I was afraid of, of winning or losing, or am I, everyone tells me I'm good, but, and I had this thought, and this is the line that occurred to me, and I didn't have the courage, and that's the operative word, the courage, the insight to say this when I was 15, because you don't have that self-awareness. All I could think about is this, if I'm so good, why am I so scared? And I've literally had people like start to tear up, you know, like adults who realize, oh my God, they've been going through their life. Like everyone, goes, you're really good at this. You're really good at this. But whether it's public speaking or growing their business or, or staying married or getting married or, or fixing a relationship or making money. If I'm so, I have all of this knowledge. I've done this course, but like something's not clicking. If I'm so good, why am I so scared? Or if I'm fill in the blank, why am I scared? I make this joke that 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 the fear fear management needs new management, <laughs> right? Because nobody likes to talk about fear. I don't want to talk about that, but it 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 changes everything. My wife's been trying to get me to you know work on our will and our our you know I'm 62 and my mom just passed away last year and it was like okay you're next in line. Hey, we got to talk about this and I'm like I'm busy, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, I don't want to talk about like this day and this. Um, and so this is, but it's the same thing wherever, I mean, like your, your show, obviously, because of what you're best known for probably attracts a certain type of demographic, but everyone listening to this, whether you're in the firearms or not, fear afflicts something in your life. You can't say, I love you. You can't say, I'm sorry. You can't, you ask somebody on a date. You can't public speak. It's, it's amazing, uh, where it, it shows up. And most importantly, um, and, and, I, and I came about this, this is like the, the craziest long answer to how did this get started? Uh, you know, like the skiing to, to spear, because 
It's fear that triggers the startle flinch that inspired the SPEAR system, which is the acronym for spontaneous protection, enabling accelerated response. Your body has this uh, organic uh, uh, um, survival system that's kept us alive for hundreds of thousands of years, uh, and it bypasses our executive function and our cognitive brain, the startle flinch response. So I figured out it's taken me decades how to weaponize the start of flinch. So anybody, regardless of their training or their background, uh, is something that your stimulus gets introduced too quickly, meaning a sudden violent encounter, your body will have a micro or a major flinch where the hands will come up, cover your head, try to push away danger, your fingers play, your extensor chain is recruited, you're pushing away danger. It's like an organic airbag. It's fucking amazing. And I figured it out by accident because of fear in in the 80s. So there, it's all like... This like like this like gorgeous elegant dance together. It's truly holistic. It's this blend of of uh, I describe it as the sciences of physiology, kinesiology, and psychology meet, and so neuroscience meeting self defense. And uh, but the 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 fear management part was it was and is for a competitive shooter somebody using their firearm in home defense, uh, somebody trying to grow their business, somebody trying to be successful in relationship. Fear is always the wild card. But if we don't ever think about it, we won't look for it, right? Like if it never occurred to you that maybe I'm just afraid of something, we won't look for it. And then, and therefore you, you, you know, you can't create a solution. Well, I know when I was younger, I would like opportunities would come up or events would come up. And when I'd see them, I would hop on the opportunity. I'd sign up. And then as soon as I signed up, I would start talking to myself that, what the hell are you doing? Why are you going? You don't deserve to go to that event or you're going to screw up this one. And by the time the event actually arrived, yeah, I had an entire list of excuses and reasons. I was yeah, too really. busy to go. My kids had this going on. Interesting. And there was times yeah. I would actually back out, which... I mean, you tell me, but that probably actually even made it worse because then when I signed up for the next one, I knew in the back of my mind. That was an option. This is going to be a loop that I was going to go through again. Yeah. You, you know, uh, we have a maxim and it's really um, more accurately uh, used to describe neural patterns and, and signal speed of the brain and the neuroscience. But the maxim is careful you practice, you might get really good at the wrong thing. And, and it's the same thing if because because you can practice quitting. And as long as you rationalize it properly, it, it's never quitting for you. It's like, of course, I would do that. But, you know, the timing wasn't right. But it's and, then, you know, of course, like self-awareness is, is the superhuman uh, um, kind of power. We all wish we understood more because the self-awareness piece is huge. In fact, I, I have a contention that because you know in the self-defense community defensive tactics combatives everyone talks about situational awareness and how important it is and yes it is we have you know uh, we like to tell people no awareness no chance if you don't know something's about to happen then how do you get ready for it yeah you even react to it if you didn't even know so situational awareness is of course huge but there's there's a subtle nuance to accurate situational awareness or acting on such a, like a, like a, a pre-contact indicator or pre-contact cue from the situational awareness perspective. In other words, if I can talk myself out of it through cognitive dissonance, I don't want to get involved in no, nah, Hey, be the courageous bystander. No, we don't know the backstory here. Nah, nah. And really it's fear redirecting what would be right action. That's the problem. And so I hypothesize that it's self-awareness is actually the gateway to functional, uh, fully operational situational awareness. If I don't know that I'm prejudiced, then that affects my situational awareness. If I don't know that I'm a bad drunk, then I go to you, Scott, these fucking guys, you know, every Friday night I get in a fight with one of these guys. You're like looking at me going, yeah, it's like I've known you for 10 years. You get into a fight every Friday night <laughs> and every Friday night you get drunk and you go to the same bar and you get in a fight with different people. Let's see. Hmm. What, what are the constants here? Bar 
alcohol and you, right? But I, but I go, I don't have a drinking problem, man. These guys are assholes, right? So I'm using like, obviously like a cartoony example, but truly um, you probably know, and there's probably a period in your life or for some things you say to yourself out loud or silently, why does this shit always happen to me? I think every human says that. You guys can't see this, but everyone, including myself, is nodding on the on this call. Yeah. This is just audio. But there are certain things, there are certain areas of your life, like you're a pretty good shooter, I would imagine. Decent. I, I'm better at building than I am shooting, right. but yes. <laughs> right. But you're a pretty good shooter. Yes. And so you go to the range and you're going and you're teaching, let's say, a, a good friend, just like some basic, you know, this isn't like some, some ipsic world-class dig dude and you're here going hey, do this watch this ding 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 but this person let's go full circle is afraid of guns but they haven't said out loud they go hey things are getting a little crazy i uh, got a gun would you teach me how to shoot you probably had that conversation once right a lot of times yes there, but they they're they're afraid and they've never said you can a gun blow up and blow my hands up and blow my eyes out well i could if you're using this type of ammunition and the shitty gun, uh, but they're, whatever, they're not articulating their fear. And so they're anticipating recoil, but they're not just anticipating recoil and jerking the trigger. They're visualizing the gun's going to blow up. The gun could, could blow up. I could get shot at the range. I could, and they're thinking about all those things. And so they're in the fear loop the entire time and they can't hear your instructions. So it, it's, it's really, now that person, let's go back to what I was talking about specifically, they say to themselves after, um, fuck, I, I, I always miss the target from this distance here. And you go, well, you know, can you see your right-handed shooter? And so you're pulling, you're, 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 you're slapping the trigger here and it's jerking your hand to the left here on the right-handed because you're not, you're not squeezing the trigger back properly here. Here's an exercise. Do this dry fire. And they're, and you're trying to correct a biomechanic that has nothing to do with the biomechanic. It has to do with what they're visualizing in the fear loop. And we're not talking about that. We'll, we, we, we say you're anticipating recoil. So do this like dry fire exercise. But like until the person goes, I'm really afraid here. And you go, well, what are you afraid? And, and you, you dissect that. And then you say, listen. God forbid, or whoever you believe in, you needed to pull your weapon at night during an attempted home invasion, you will be afraid. So is it okay now for you to practice shooting while you're afraid? Like that's a light bulb moment. Oh my yeah. God. Because, because if I'm on the range, I saw a big smile on your face there because you, you got that, right? It's like, yes. we should practice shooting afraid. And if you're not afraid, you're not visualizing a scenario. Why would you not be afraid during a home invasion? Why would you not be afraid during a death match where somebody's trying to kill you? And so like, that's truly like another layer of that stress inoculation. And that's why I say most coaches aren't coaches, they're trainers. But let me tell you why you're, you're, you're pulling, you're throwing the round to the left. It's your biomechanics. It's your, no, no, it's not my biomechanics. Yes, it is. We're both right. But the mind navigates the body. There is no such thing as muscle memory, although everybody uses the term. Muscles don't have the capacity to store memory, right? It's the neural pattern and how you train yourself on what you're, why you're holding the grip a certain way and how you're going to counterbalance certain things. And yeah, there's physics and all that. But if I can't, if I can't get to the core of the, get the person to realize, I want to learn how to shoot or I want to learn this skill and I'm afraid of this, 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 this. And it, it's so often we use muscle memory in our industry all the time. Yeah. And I've never looked at it that way, which makes so much sense. And do you ever see like the other side of it? Like the people that just think just because they carry all day that they almost become complacent and think, they're safer than they really are because I know I've heard you talk about like so many times confrontations take place in very close quarters. Yeah. You know, not like you just talked about it. It's not how we train where we're out on a range and, you know, practicing all that it's instantaneous. Yeah. You know, element of surprise. Well, I, all I, you know, I make it just, so to answer your question, complacency, um, I think there are people who are complacent 
you who are empty hand martial artists, right? They don't, it's not about carrying. It's like, oh, I got a black belt or I got a gun. Well, the gun doesn't shoot itself. And like most people practice shooting, but they don't practice getting their gun out of their holster. And if they practice getting their gun out of the holster, even some of the best guys that I know, who I know have actually been in gunfights, when you watch them train, and this isn't a challenge for any of you listening to me, but when you watch them train, they're standing there and they're like, right? And they're doing their, their dry fires. And it's great. The basics are there, but they're not practicing it where the stimulus is a fear spike. And, 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 and what I mean by that, you, you, you can't, nobody can see this, but I'm going to demo this if it doesn't fall out of my, but you guys can see the Bob dummy in the background here, but I can be here like this and Bob's choking me and I go smack, smack and I hit him. And then I draw my weapon. You, and nobody can see this. So like, like, again, you guys, you guys can, but it'd be like, uh, I've got my gun in like appendix carry it's concealed and the bad guy jumps me. I'm at dinner, I'm getting out of my car, I'm at a gas station, and all of a sudden, boom, this is on me. Start a flinch fear, weaponize the start a flinch, push away danger, create space, then draw your weapon. That, to me, is true dry fire pra- or, or, or drawing, you know, a, a drawing from concealment practice. When I see most people do this, it's like in their house, they're doing the work, but it's static, there's no stimulus. And so, you know, we have, uh, 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 again, after 40, you know, I've been studying violence and fear and aggression for 43 years and teaching, I've been teaching since 1977. Um, but we tell people we practice off balance on purpose, off balance, emotionally, psychologically, physically, to the best we can. We, we work from position because if I can figure it out how to win from a place or position of adversity, then I surely can figure out how to win if I'm stable mentally, physically, you know, like, and so j- just so for everybody, again, who can't see this, um, and I wish we could <laughs> record that and let them see that, um, the, the, uh, uh, um, if you have a big audience, I'd be happy to like do a short like Zoom thing with your audience one day and just show them some ideas to practice. Okay. But, but this idea is, uh, if you're practicing just standing in front of the mirror, like, you know, De Niro, like what we see on Instagram all the time, yeah. we're, you know, guys are standing, they're doing, they're, they're just drawing and they're practicing and they're dialing in their, their technique and their, their, the accuracy, uh, uh, and coordination and then agility that is necessary to do, but I need people to recognize like that's an isolation drill. And if you said, like, I would argue there's no scenario connected to that other than I am the courageous bystander at a distance from the actual event. The bad guy doesn't know I'm there yet and doesn't know I have a gun. In other words, if I'm standing here like this, and again, I'm sticking a cert in my pants that have that literally will fall down and break my toe because I don't have a holster on here. <laughs> but if I'm practicing, if I'm standing here like this and I'm practicing, you know, simulating like, a, a, you know, a, a, you know, my, my like a quick draw coming out and, move, and moving through there. And you see guys doing that on Instagram, boom, boom and they're going tick, tick and right in there. And they're, they're doing the whole dry, dry fire ritual that could have an application again, if there's an active shooter away from you and i always make this joke and it's not a joke that if you're the target in a sudden violent encounter your gun will not be in your shooting hand unless your gun was already in your shooting hand meaning you were having dinner with your gun duct taped to your hand does that make sense can you visualize that yeah that makes so so if i'm I'm sitting in a car i just filled up my gas tank and i sat down and and i go to start the car and all of a sudden, two guys run out, and they got guns at the window. And I go, "Whoa!" And my hands go up into the start of flinch, which is also the surrender position. You don't have your derringer like James West in the old, you know, Wild Wild <laughs> West TV show up your fucking sleeve, popping out and shooting the guy. So if your if your gun is appendix, or if it's in a lockbox, or if it's on your ankle, like you're nowhere near it. So are you practicing getting to your gun when you're the target in a sudden ambush? It's a whole different 
So we have a whole course on that called uh, Confined Space Combatives. Okay. And is that kind of like what the, what the spear system is about is teaching people, you know, real life scenarios, it's, you know, it's, and it's part and of so it. much of the psychology behind it, you know, because like, this might be hard to answer, but what happens to like the average person, you know, that hasn't necessarily been in law enforcement or military when they're attacked, what, like from the neuro side, what happens to them during that? Well, like, like so listen, in 1985, like the eighties were my incubator period for third, from 1980 to 1993, I was doing stuff that was like, like fight club before fight club was a movie. Uh, and we didn't do it without, we had gear on, but we would do like, like six on one, six on two, three on twos. And they were all set up around scenarios. When one of my students got his ass kicked in 1980. And, and when he told me what happened, I realized, oh my God, we teach self-defense wrong. And I said it like collectively at the age of 20, like there was no scenario infusion. Even if you say scenario, it doesn't mean just cause you say, go stand over there and let's pretend it's a bar fight. If you square off, you're still sparring. You're just sparring near uh, like a like a bar. You're like, but that's not a scenario. You're not you're not walking through what we call the timeline of violence, where your elements of of avoidance and situational awareness are being massaged and integrated. Uh, very relevant components of de-escalation and, and avoidance are being in, integrated. Nonviolent postures to support and facilitate de-escalation are being, you know, injected in there. So you're developing this holistic approach, which now if I drop you back into the real world, you go, ah, my training was relevant. My training was realistic. And it's not. If you look at most body cam, CCTV, smartphone videos, you don't see people performing and looking like John Wick or or Bruce Lee or Van Damme or whatever. A lot of it is, and so, you know, even trained cops, military, if it's sudden violence and it's true surprise, they get, you know, the, you know, the fancy term for it is it like in some cases an amygdala hijack where they react to brain, they just lose focus. But really what's happening is a stimulus gets introduced too quickly. Your executive function, which is responsible for making cool decisions and, and, and is, is directly connected to your cognitive brain. So if I said to you, uh, Scott, what would you do if this happened? You know, uh, I go, what would you do if, if you were shooting and your your gun ran dry. You go, well, yeah, I'd drop the mag and fucking, you know, reload. And then, you know, one day, you, like, you get in a gunfight and, you, you know, you're, you're with your family and your friends and you're blasting down here and your gun goes dry and there's rounds coming at you. In, in the studio, you go, well, I would just transition another magazine. But can we envision and imagine that, the stress of what's happening, screaming, blood, yelling, uh, chaos, that like maybe I pulled the trigger two extra times and realize, oh, fuck, I'm dry. I didn't, the gun didn't go bang. And I'm like, this is like a stupid thing to say, but, but these are the conversations that I have with people because I go, well, what would you do there? And how would you know? And what would you, how would you manage the fear? And what, and what would you do if you, you didn't have another mag to go to? That was your second or third mag. And people were like, oh, uh, like, because now what that does is it changes the emotional relationship to the scenario we're talking about. And that totally changes the, 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 the training and maybe uh, inspires how you're going to, how you're going to practice or things that you're going to, that, that you're going to do. Um, to specifically answer what happens to the untrained person versus the trained person Unfortunately, the same thing can happen to both. We've seen trained people freeze, uh, and there's a it's a, an interesting question I love to ask people: what's the, what's the difference between freezing and choking? You know, like when you hear the expression yeah. like that athlete choked. Well, an untrained person freezes; a trained person chokes. But the outcome for performance can look the same. 
So, so I go, ah, like there's, there's pictures of train, let's say cops who are going, get, drop it, drop it, drop it, drop it. And the guy's like charging the guy and he doesn't get his gun out of his holster, even though his hand's indexing his gun. But that guy's qualified. He knows how to draw his weapon and shoot. He had, so if I said to him the day before this event where he got stabbed and he couldn't get his gun out in time and his partner ends up shooting the suspect, the day before, if I had said to that trained officer, do you understand use of force? Yes. Do you understand your agency's policy for deadly force? Yes. If a guy came at you with a knife, do you understand the whole Tula principle, the 21 foot, you know, research that you need 21 feet to get offline? Yeah, yeah, I know all that. So if a guy came running at you with a knife, what would you do? If I draw my gun, I get off. Like he could describe his cognitive brain can visualize and describe exactly what's going to happen the day before. And then when it happens, and that's why I say, you know, you know, on, on, on game day, you, you, you know, you can't be a better tactical athlete on game day. It's all mindset. How do I control what I'm thinking? How do I control how I'm breathing my, my state, my physiological state. And then this, this, this idea, which is crazy because I always tell people why we changed, um, why we call our program, no fear, K N O W fear is because there are many situations in life where there will be fear. And if we can't change our relationship with fear in event in, in advance of the event, then fear becomes that additional force that can derail us like me as a skier, right? So fear can be fuel or, or it could be this very distracting energy in your brain where you're the fear loop. I, I love using the acronym uh, fear, false expectations appearing real, where we're visualizing something in the future that's debilitating us in the present. So I'm trying to ski down the course going, you know, don't catch a tip, don't catch, don't catch a tip. Or a golfer, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't golf, I tried it for a bit, but you know, it was, <laughs> I, I, make, I make the joke, I don't know if either of you golf, but- um, I try to. Or try to, but it's like, you know this then, like if, if you come up and there's a, then there's water to the right, what is your brain thinking? You're up, you're up on there and you got your iron out because you don't want to risk it with a driver and there's water there. You're thinking, don't hit it in the water, right? And where does the ball almost always go? If right in the water. water. Right in the water. So the mind navigates the body, as weird as that sounds, the black box element there. But you can't perform at your best if you don't have the self-awareness to go, listen, you can't say just before you're about to do something, I hope I don't miss this shot. You can't say, I hope I don't hit the wall in the water. I hope I don't fuck this up. I hope before this speech, I don't get uh, stage fright. I hope I don't forget to say this part. Like, because, uh, you know, there, there's an expression, never motivate yourself through a negative. And so depending on on what era you were, you were like, I grew up in the 60s, everything was negative. Like, every, if I came home with an A on an exam, my mother was pissed. Why didn't you get an A plus? You need to study harder. It was never, and of course, the pendulum has gone so fucking far the other way that if I come home with an F, you know, it's like, okay, maybe you need a drug and you should be on some meds and I'm going to go speak to the school. The test was too hard. You, you should be able to retake the test because. Yeah, or I'm going to give you an award for coming in last, you know, yeah. so the world is so woke and pussified. Uh, it's, it's gone so far the other way. But anyways, um, I don't know where I am. I lost. I'm, 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 I've lost my mind thinking about the insanity of the world. <laughs> that can happen to all of us. So like in, in that fear loop, how much of that comes from like the words? Because coming full circle, you know, we talked about Jay when we started the podcast. That was one of the big, big things that I learned from him is be very careful with the wording you use when you're, when you're dealing with people, relationships, or even the relationship with yourself. Yep. You know, because, you know, even little things like if somebody says, thank you, I know he was always big on like, don't say no problem because you're instantly using a negative. Right. After they've complimented you, you know, say something like you're welcome or something more reaffirming positive. Right. So how much of that, like when we're dealing with ourselves comes from limiting self-talk or negative self-talk that we, you know, like you said, with the analogy of don't hit the ball, right? Don't go in the water. Yeah. Well, you'll, you'll dig this because you're a shitty golfer like me. I don't know. What, what do you shoot? I'm usually, at best, a bogey golfer. Okay. So so no one knows what that means, Scott. But okay. <laughs> um, uh, 
the uh, if if I break a hundred, I think I'm doing good. So okay. so that's fine. You can go and have fun. I've broken a hundred, and I've 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 shot way worse, and I've thrown my golf club further than I've hit the ball sometimes, and uh, it's an insanely difficult sport. But when I was getting into it. Uh, I like to, if I'm going to suck at something, I want to be responsible for sucking. And if I'm going to be really good, I also want to be responsible for being really good. So I went all in. I got books. I got videos. I was studying it. And uh, there's a story I tell that that uh, that is the best answer to your question about self-talk. And Freddie Couples, if you remember who that is. Yeah. Um, uh he was getting coached by, oh, God, I forget the coach name. Very, very famous coach. And Couples is, is you know, uh, um, he's a lefty, but, he, you know, he's practicing and he hit the ball. And he's like, oh, fuck, man. Like, and he's on the team. And you hit it again. He goes, God, fuck you, suck. Come on, get it. <laughs> and, he's, and his coach is standing there watching. And he goes, uh, and he says, and he's describing this in this in this book. He says, and I said to Freddie, I said, Freddie, if you hired me to coach your son, and he hit the ball and I looked at him and I said, fuck you suck as his coach. Would you keep paying me to coach him? Would you be a fan as his dad? Would you go, hey dude, don't talk to my son that way. And he's like, yeah. He says, so why do you talk to yourself that way? I was like really heavy. I got goosebumps now thinking about that. Yeah. But a lot of it, like it's, it's heavy and I get that. But um, so for me, most of my life was that type of self-talk. So I know you know, this is very subtle. And again, then we come back to what I say, the superpower for all of us is to continue to evolve our, our connection to true self-awareness, not rationalize self-awareness. Well, this is how I am, you know? So I'll do things like, let's say I hit my head. I'm doing something, I'm paying attention. I bend over, I smash my head. The first thing that'll come out of my mouth is you fucking idiot. Ow. Then the part of me, that has the self-awareness goes, then I go, then I go to, to mock, oh, do good thing you're a, a situational awareness coach. Yeah. Look how like, and I, then I start making fun of myself and then I'm like going, dude, get this together. What's the lesson here? Right? So yeah. I go through those stages because of self-awareness. I realize that I, I was, there's a, I don't want to say DNA in the literal sense, but because that I spent 20 years of my life from the age of being born to 20 in that culture, like, you don't, know, it's just not like a, like a light switch. So I think we need to be uh, mindful and response and responsive to like who we are at our core, but also I will say this, and this is super provocative because I, I train a lot of trainers. That's my main business is coaching coaches on how to better become better coaches. And it can be any industry because if when you understand this this these elements of neuroscience, you become more effective talking to different people. So for example, um, in the fight game. So I've been in UFC uh, uh, locker rooms. I've been in boxing locker rooms. I've been in kickboxing locker, locker rooms. And unless you're Conor McGregor or Ali or whatever, you're not like everyone shares rooms. You might have be in a room with 20 other fighters if it's like low level amateur, or you might be, you know, there might be six other fighters or whatever. And you'll see, and again, this is audio, so you guys can't see it, but you see like one guy sitting on a massage table, you know, just looking down at the floor. He's got headphones on. He's listening to music. He's not moving. Then you see somebody else, you know, with that, their leg is pumping away like they're on a sewing machine. They're, you know, you're sitting there like when you've got that nervous energy and your, your foot's pumping on the ground, you're looking around. Uh, then there's somebody else walking, pacing, maybe punching their face a little bit, moving around. Some, I, it, like I've seen guys like in front of a locker bank, just banging their head against the locker bank. And they're just visualizing. But each one of them has a different pre-fight ritual that they feel they need to do to get them through the fight. So for example, let's say, let's say you love classical music and I'm your coach and I'm a former champion and I love Metallica. And I go, guys, let's get ready. And I put on Metallica. Like you're like, Oh fuck. I hate this music. And it's changing your vibe and you know how powerful music can be for all of us so what i'm sharing here is that that one of the problems with i think 
every coaching or training industry, whether it's shooting or whether it's fighting, self-defense, playing guitar, whatever it is, is that there's this, this without saying it, this one size fits all. If you want to be good, do this, because this is what, you know, Jimmy Page did, you know. Uh, this is what, uh, uh, you know, this is how, you know, this ex, you, you know, uh, special operations guy, like, and I don't know if we've got time to do this. I'll tell this story. Angelo Dundee trained Muhammad Ali, Angelo D Dundee trained Sugar Ray Leonard, and a bunch of other uh, champions, right? And Angelo Dundee couldn't last a minute with any of the guys that he trained. In other words, his skill was in creating strategies and training and motivation and coaching to help these guys believe in the strategy so that when they faced somebody else formidable at their level, that they could get through that 15 round fight, that 12 round fight, whatever it was. And he trained the best. Well, Sugar Ray Leonard, who's an arguably one of the greatest boxers ever, won world titles in five weight classes. And he may be the only one or one of two people that have ever done that. Did you know, Scott, that uh, Leonard also managed and coached fighters? I did not. Well, how could you not know? And how could and most people don't know this. How could you not know that one of the most famous athletes of our generation, one of the greatest boxers ever, managed and coached boxers? How, why would, why, what's the only reason most people don't know that? Because he wasn't any good at it. No offense, Sugar Ray. Don't punch me out yeah. when you see me because <laughs> he can still move. But what I mean by that, it was like, it wasn't that he didn't care, but his gift was inside the ropes, not outside the ropes. And, and, and the evidence of this, like they, there was a, a Canadian um, uh, Olympian, uh, Sean, oh man, I just forgot his last name. He, 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 he titled for Canada in the Olympics. Uh, and I just forgot his last name, Sean, ah, whatever. Um, fuck, that pisses me off. Somebody Google that and tell me. Um, but the um, uh, he got called by, by Leonard's team and said, Sugar Leonard wants to coach you. Imagine getting a call after you, you get, I think you got bronze or silver in the Olympics and going, Sugar Leonard wants to coach you. Like, what are you thinking right there? You're like, oh my God, I made it. I'm going in, I'm going to turn pro. And he lost his first fight, lost his second fight. I think he got knocked out his third fight, something like that. And then retired with Sugar Ray Leonard in his corner or in his camp. So this isn't a put down about, about Leonard. This is this idea of like, I can't take my greatness or my insight or my unicornness and just sprinkle magic dust on you. And I've never thought about it this way, but you would probably know much more like with Custy Amato when he passed and Tyson all of a sudden wasn't the most invincible or the baddest man on the planet. Yeah. He didn't forget the mechanic. I, I'm assuming I'm asking you this, but I assume he didn't forget the mechanics of how to knock people out, how to move. But he lost that voice in his head and Cuss who had yeah. basically raised him and taught him the psychology or the mental part of it. Sure. And 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 Cuss had amazing was so into I use a bunch of his quotes in our seminars. Because, because, uh, like his ideas on 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 fear and courage, you know, one of one of his great quotes is, uh, you know, the the um, the difference between the the coward and and the and the hero is what they do with their fear that they both feel it. Oh, wow. you know, um, but yeah, so that could be a factor. I mean, there are other factors, of course, for Tyson's uh, <laughs> fall from grace. You know, you get too rich too quickly. You get too powerful. You're surrounded by yes men. And suddenly you're, you know, you go through the competition and you kind of lose your edge. You go, I've, I've made it. So there are other factors. But quite probably had Cus been alive, he'd have never let that happen as his guardian. And, and as that, you know, going, hey, dude, you know, it's like having a really good friend going, what the fuck's up, Scott? Knock this shit out, right? And even, you know, going back to the golf analogy, if you look at like a guy like Tiger Woods, who was invincible when his dad was around, 
Right. It wasn't too long yeah. after he passed that it's, his life came crashing cool. down. He's the, he's the Mike Tyson of golf. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. so I don't know if we have time for this, but I did have one more question. Back Over. to the whole self-awareness thing. How important, I've heard you talk about like most people don't know what their limits are a lot of times. And the story I heard you use to describe that is if you ask somebody how many push-ups they can do, uh -huh. you'll get a round number of 20, 30, 40, 50, whatever it is. But when you were trying to break the record of one arm push-ups, you had it down to like the third of a push-up that you could do. I think it was 57 and a third. <laughs> 57. That's incredible, by the way. <laughs> it, 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 it was for a minute. And then the new Guinness Book of World Records came out and it was something like 120 and 60 seconds. Wow. And then I was like, I read it again. I read it again. There's got to be a typo. And then it was like, okay, 57 and a third is pretty good. I'll, I'll, I'll go on to something yeah. else there. So, I, so how much do you think our fear of either failure or pushing ourselves to that limit comes to play to keep us from ever knowing what our true limits are. So, so probably the companion quote to that concept is you'll never know how much you can do until you try to do more than you can. And so to see how far can I run? How far can I hike? How fast can I shoot? How many push-ups can I do? I really need to go to failure. I remember trying to coach some of this into my son when he was young and you know, teaching him some self-defense stuff. And he was he was really young, but I grappling with him and I get him in a rear strangle and I'm teaching him these counters and I start to choke him. And it's on like scary tight, but not dangerous. And he's going, Dad, Dad, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And I whispered in his ear, if you couldn't breathe, you wouldn't be able to talk. So you can keep fighting, right? <laughs> like just explaining <laughs> it, like there's still there's there's still there, you need to go for this, you know. Yeah. And um uh, so the, I think the reason why, and just to understand the, the, the concept, you know, most of my work, although my most fun courses are no fear courses, cause I believe that if I teach somebody how to manage fear, they'll figure out how to fight, even if they don't know how to fight. I really believe we're all human weapons. We all know how to protect ourselves because that's how we evolved. Um, but we've all been domesticated and we've outsourced our safety for so long that something dangerous starts to happen and we immediately go, oh fuck, call the police. And that should just be one of the things you do. Yeah. But not just sit there with your thumb in your mouth, like waiting. Barry and Dumb and Dumber waiting for the police. <laughs> um, so when I ask, so I'm usually around a bunch of like tape, type A personalities and I go, uh, okay, how many push-ups? How many push-ups? Give me a number, give me a number. And the number's always even, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. And the only time it's an odd number is somebody being a smart ass, meaning like you show up at your buddy and he says 50 and his buddy goes next and he goes, he looks at me, smiles, he goes 51. You know, but he's being a smart ass. Yeah. Cool. I want up to you. Um, nobody knows how many push-ups they can do until they try to do more push-ups than they can do. And that's the message. And so when I ask that, I always have that, that companion quote. Uh, and, and I go, like, it may not be important for you to know how many you can do, but it's really an opportunity to discuss limiting beliefs or numbers. So if I say to you, if someone gets a rear strangle on you, if I ask people, someone gets a lateral vascular neck restraint, a rear strangle, how long do you tap out? Do you know? No. Okay, so the urban legend of it, it's four to seven seconds. If somebody is in a little bit in the know, they'll say someone gets a rear strangle on you, uh, you, you're unconscious in four to seven seconds. And they've had lots of people, you know, they get in position and strangle comes on. The person's getting ready for tap, squeeze, 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 squeeze. And people will pass out just like four, five, six, seven seconds, depending on the size of the neck, size of the arm. So that becomes now, that becomes how many push-ups can you do? So if you believe it's four to seven seconds and we're fighting and I, and I hit you and you, you spin and all of a sudden I grab you and you feel the arms coming around, um, you'll see even in pro fighters that haven't fought through it, you'll see like in UFC and MMA fights, guys get a rear strangle on. You see people, you see the fighters stop struggling and they're starting to think and it's almost like they're counting down. That's the hypothesis here is I've created a belief 
a Roger Bannister effect. Nobody will ever break a four minute mile. Then Bannister does it. And then within two weeks, 14 other people did it. But until then, everyone said no, no human will ever run a four minute mile. Right. So if I if you grow up and I say, look, someone gets you in a rear strangle, you've got four seconds to get out of that. And you're here like this. And part of your brain's going three, two, one. Oh, fuck. And you're tapping. Right. Is this making any sense? So you go, yeah, you go, well, I go no, it makes perfect sense. And, 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 and I remember and I remember saying to this one cop in this in uh, to make a point, you know, he said 50 push ups. And I said, uh, I know this this visual is going to be problematic for you, but it's to make a point. If I, I said, do you have any kids? He says, yeah, I got a little girl. I go, how old? He's 11. I said, I grab her by the ponytail and you see his his eyes change. Right. Just the idea, like I grabbed your daughter by the ponytail and I got a gun to the back of her head. And you see this guy like straighten up in class and you could tell he's like, dude, this is all, whatever, whatever you're doing, don't talk about my kids like that in class. Very fucking uncomfortable. And I said to you, and I'm holding her like this, I got her part of ponytail, I got a gun to her head. And I said, hey, if you don't do 51 push-ups, I'm going to kill your kid. And this guy, like, he was pissed. I said, you told me you could only do 50. What's what's going to happen here? And he doesn't even answer. I go, You're, you want to you fucking hit me right now, don't you? He goes, maybe. I said, you don't like that scenario, yeah. I said, would you be able to do 51 push-ups now to save your daughter's life? He's like, yeah. I go, and what you're doing while you're doing them, you're thinking of a way, how do I take out this gunman? How do I fucking kill this guy? Right. And so the idea of like, if I have, if I set the limiting belief without saying, this is my limiting belief. If I set it accidentally, then like, that's like, that's when I stop trying. And, and how many times do we do that? You know, that scenario obviously is extreme and it gets the point across very vividly, but how many times do we do that throughout our lives? Like you said earlier, in business, in relationships, in that's it. You know, we, we limit ourselves so much and I've never looked at it that way, but damn, it, that it, hits home. It's, it's, it's a whole other part of that. Why does this always happen to me? And yeah. but like, so that's the self-awareness piece. Why do I get in a fight every Friday night? Fuck. I don't know what, like, how come these assholes come to the bar and come right to me? And go, yeah. You know, <laughs> It, and it, you know, and it's and it's so funny because uh, I, you know, I had a, um, I was teaching a, a, a seminar, and I said, I was just talking about the first place that we're attacked in a real confrontation is our emotional system, our gut, and so every if if you get to one of our be your own bodyguard courses, we talk about that every victim of violence who lived to tell the tale say they had a bad feeling before the attack, but most people don't know how to act with courage on the bad feeling because the bad feeling is like the opening the Pandora's box of fear. What if I'm right? What if I am being followed? What if these, what if I am in danger? It's scary, but guess what? If the stimulus that triggered the feeling was real, you are in danger. <laughs> and the longer you ignore it, the more danger you're in. But it's just easier for them to ignore it and not. Well, but, that, but that's what everyone confront. Does. The, yeah, you know, like you've had a toothache and you didn't go to the dentist right away. Right. And then you go there like a week later. He goes, "Dude, fuck, man! Like, take these antibiotics, but next time coming early, this could turn into root canal. That's fucking right." But because you're afraid to go to the dentist and find out, we, we all do that. Yeah. You've all everyone, everyone listening to this has been fucked over in a relationship, in business and a personal relationship. And we all had a bad feeling before. And then when it happened and the dust settled, we all said, you know, I knew that was going to happen. I knew that guy was lying. I knew there's something off there. Am I right? I mean, fuck. 100 percent. Yeah. Right? But because we don't nobody ever teaches us how to listen to, to in, intuition. And then this again, that's why I say that the, the, the most important thing we could do is learn how to get to know fear and change our relationship with fear because there's no downside to exploring that. It just makes you stronger. I've got a bad feeling about this. Well, let's do some research. Is this Google research? Is it medical research? Is it financial research? Is it self-defense research? Because when you do it, you just get educated. And if there was nothing there, now you have like this preemptive knowledge. 
your perception speed has improved. Your perception speed has increased and improved, and therefore your future reaction time has improved because you have a mental blueprint for what this could look like. Do men struggle with this more than women because we're not supposed to quote unquote show fear? Um, man, fear has been so weaponized in the last few years. I think everyone's fucked up. Okay. But, I, but I but I would say. Yeah, statistically, men struggle with it more because there's an element of us that we're supposed to be the provider, the protector, macho. Although looking around society, you, you don't see a lot of that anymore. But but I think I think maybe there's a like a genetic predisposition to that. You know, just like me in 1975 as a 15 year old kid. You know, hey, how do you feel, kid? Great, coach. Like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say. Hey, coach, I'm fucking scared shitless. What's going on? Yeah. Because you don't know. You're like, it, but we also don't have good education about fear management. It's all fight, flight, freeze, you know, uh, you, know b- you know, big words. And, and, and uh, like, I, I want to understand not the neurobiology of fear when it's time to go. I need to understand the psychology of fear. It's, it's what's happening in my head because I'm not going to change. You know, I'm not going to, I don't have a button on my arm to reduce the adrenaline going through my body. Yeah. It's an interesting thing. You know, I love always sharing this expression. I think it's, I think it should be your next tattoo. You can't be brave if you're not afraid. You can't be brave if you're not afraid. The primary ingredient of courage is fear. If I ask you to do something that requires courage of you, then by default, you must be afraid before you do it. If I ask you to do something, if I say to you, run into this burning building and a firefighter goes, okay, before I do that, I'll make sure I'm not going to die. Let me check this. Okay. Is that going to do that? Fuck shit. Okay. We got to go fast. We've got a three minute window. Look where the flames are. All of that assessment is fear based, but it's not fear for the untrained. It's not, it doesn't sound like fear for the person who's, who's not trained like that calculation, right? Yeah. Why do, if you go skydiving, why do you pack your, your parachute a certain way? And why do you have a secondary sheet? Because of fear. Why do you look both ways before you cross the street? Because of fear. Why do you why do you make sure you've got a round in the chamber before you go out? All based on fear. Right? So fear can fear, like Customato said, one of his quotes, he says, fear can cook your food and warm your house. It can also burn your food and burn your house down. Like, how are you using the flame? So it's it's changing that relationship with fear and and uh, either make it serve us, use it as fuel, recognizing that there are many events in our lives that we need to do afraid. And then you might get to a certain point where the event, uh, the scenario, you've done it so many times that you know, like, for example, the number one fear in the world is still public speaking. It's not getting dragged to the secondary crime scene, which would, to me seems like a much scarier proposition. It's not getting stuffed in a trunk. It's not getting raped. It's not getting murdered. It's public speaking, loss of a loved one, sharks, violence. Like, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> that list is fucked up. I once said this at a talk at a, at a university, hundreds of kids kids they were you know 17 18 year olds and i said to them in this amphitheater i said hey what's the number one fear in the world now they have public speaking i said how many women in the audience it was like 75 percent. how many of you are worried about date rape and getting raped fucking all the hands come up how many of you would rather come up on stage and give a shitty speech or get raped in an alley the teachers and the administrators looked at me they weren't (laughs) <laughs> they weren't very happy <laughs> at how direct and blunt, but I was trying to show like well, how stupid yeah. we are with what our priorities are. You know, I talk about this, uh, that, that every one of us practices self-defense in everything we do, except for actually self-defense. If I said, if I said to most of your listeners, hey, you got to come to one of my Be Your Own Bodyguard courses, you got to come to our Essentials of Personal Safety uh, program. Most of them would rather buy more ammo and go to the range on a flat range and shoot than actually physically come and do something. And, and it's and it's weird. And that was a subtle 
shameless plug for our course, but, but a challenge, but, but I'm I'm making a joke here. Yeah. But but you're right though, that that's what most people would do. Most, most people, um, when they find out what I do, they go, Oh my God, I always want to learn how to defend myself. And I'm like, well, what stopped you from ever learning to defend yourself? You're 40 now, you're 30, you're 20, you're 50. You know how to fly a kite, you know how to skateboard, you know how to, you, you know, you, you, you got 90 guns and you go to the range and you start with, with your, your, your gun out on the table loaded. And then someone goes, okay, range is hot. You know, like, no, you yeah. can't draw from your holster. You got a, a, a target that doesn't move except for a button that moves it forward and backwards for you. If you don't like the distance and you're shooting, uh, you know, poorly, you bring the target closer so you can feel good about your shooting. <laughs> like, right. Yeah. Nobody sees, sees the problem with that. So. No, that, oh, you're so right. So I know we're up against it on time. Where can people, so if people want to know more about like the no fear system, the spear system, where's the best place to learn all about this? So our main HQ page is blowertrainingsystems.com. That's my my last name, Blower, B-L-A-U-E-R, systems.com. And that, that'll give you, there's four divisions in my company. We've got a, a scenario training equipment. We've got the whole spear system. We've got the whole no fear program. And then there's like a personal private coaching with me uh, section there. But you can get to anything there. And we've got digital, live, all sorts of resources. You can get to our training calendar. And I think my office sent you links too. Yeah, and we'll put that all in the show notes. And I know you're on Instagram, but I know you're shadow banned yeah. most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> but we'll it's put that fantastic. up there too so yeah. people can come find you. I'd love that. Well, Tony, thank you. I appreciate it. This was awesome. And I know it's opened my eyes big time to how I even view like self-defense. And, and I've watched some of your courses but I'm one of those guys that's guilty of never coming to an in-person event. Right. They're fun. They're fun. We should, yeah. uh, we should, you know, I don't, I don't like, I don't know how big your community is, but happy. Like let's, let's, let's host one and get, uh, you know, let's get everyone who's bought guns from you to come together. And, and, you know, I'll send one of my team or come out there and, uh, you know, cause it's at the end of the day, we say like the spear system is a bridge to your next move. The spear system is weaponizing the startle flinch. So if you can't manage the fear and manage the ambush, you're not going to get to your gun, you know, or you're not going to get to your elbow, your palm strike or whatever. Uh, it's, it's, this is not to replace other martial arts or loves of martial arts. It's, it's literally, like I said, we all practice self-defense. You know, you look at the ingredients on something and go, holy shit, I'm not putting that in my body. Get, let me give it something more organic or something healthier. Oh, uh, I'm not going down this street or this part of town. That's fucking dangerous. But what we don't do is actually practice physical self-defense. Uh, and, and, uh, and again, that's been my life's mission since I'm, oh, since I'm a young. I'm going to reach out to your team because I want to try to bring that here. I think, I think we could fill up a room very easily. Let's do it. Uh, let's do it. I, I'm excited. Thank you again. I know you're a very busy man, so I appreciate you taking the time. And thank you to everybody that's listened. As always, if you have any questions, hit us up at podcast at volcourtson.com. Mm-hmm.